Hello, here we are again. Welcome back. Of course, this is our second lecture, and we are moving on in Lecture 1. However, I felt it advisable to do two things. First of all, to review with you the, the way in which each chapter is set up. So let's have just a quick look at this breakdown here, so that you see in every unit, every chapter, you see each chapter, we begin with, as we did last time, with the lecture, the topic, vocabulary, and conversation close. Then we move to the section, in lecture two, the, the section, second section of the unit, or of the chapter, where we do a passage. Now what do we mean by a passage? A passage means any piece of listening. And so there's always a major passage in each unit, and that is what I'm going to present to you in a few minutes. And then we are going to look at vocabulary and context and the task of the unit. That will be true in every unit. So the passage, you notice the star beside the passage to indicate this is very important. Now what I advise you to do each time we have a lecture, when I give you the passage, listen to it. Try to understand it, become acquainted, because the passage is central to the chapter. So now you're going to hear the passage for this unit. So listen carefully, and at home, if you don't hear or understand first time, go back and listen again. This passage is central. In every chapter, the passage is central. All right, so listen. This is our passage. Good morning, everyone. My name is Richard Baldwin, and I am the academic advisor here at the English Language Center. If you have any questions about applying to a university, if you need help with your application, just come to see me in my office. So uh, this morning I want to give you a general introduction to the university system in the United States and Canada. First of all, I'm going to tell you about three types of university courses. And then my second main topic is course requirements. Now course requirements means what you have to do in order to pass a course, okay? So again, I'll talk about two topics, and then you'll have time to ask questions before we take a break, okay? All right. Now as I said, first I want to tell you about three types of university courses. And I should explain I'm talking about undergraduate courses because the system is different when you become a graduate student. So we're talking about in undergraduate study in North America. Now in North America the most common type of undergraduate course is called the lecture course. Got that? Lecture course. Now in a lecture course the professor talks, the students sit and take notes. This is the basic idea of a lecture. The teacher speaks, the, the students listen and take notes. Now, note-taking is very important. I mean, most of the time, the information the professor is giving is not exactly the same as the information in the books. He may be adding or changing information. And, of course, you can expect to have questions on your exams based on the lectures. So, you see, in North America, it is not enough to just read your textbook you must also attend the lectures. And during the lecture, of course, you're expected to be active, not just sit and listen, you should take notes. Later, you will use the notes to study for your exams, and I hope that makes it clear, lecture courses. Now, that's not the only kind, of course. As an undergraduate in almost any major, you'll be spending four to six hours a week attending lectures. That's four to six hours for each lecture course. Now that doesn't sound like much time, but please remember that this, these three or four lecture courses are many times expected that you spend three or four hours at home for each hour in class. It's not enough to just come to class. Now many of these lecture courses are very large, held in very large rooms, and for this reason they can have up to two or three hundred students. 
especially courses like Introduction to Psychology, Introduction to Biology. These introductory courses are many times very large, especially when at larger universities. So we have another type of course, and this is called the Discussion Section. There's no way for one professor to meet with 300 or more students. So in these universities, the lecture courses are supplemented by discussion sections. In other words, a group of 300 students will be divided up into maybe uh, 10 different groups, and we call these discussion sections. They meet two, uh, two or three times a week, and these are not uh, handled by the professor, but by one of his assistants, or maybe a graduate student. And this is a chance for the students to discuss things they didn't understand, to ask questions, or to have their homework checked. As I said, the professor will give the lecture, but the discussion sections are handled by assistants. So now I've told you about two types of courses, the lecture course and the discussion section. There is another kind of class, and this is especially important if you are a science major. If you're studying chemistry or biology, you might have a lab class. Lab is short for laboratory, and this means in chemistry or physics that you spend time in a lab doing practical work, experiments, or things of that sort. So we have three types of courses in the North American university system. Now, as I told you, the second topic today is course requirements. Now, as I told you before, course requirements refer to things you have to do in order to pass a course. Let me tell you some of these things. First of all, there are tests or exams. Different kinds. Uh, you have one at the middle of the course called a midterm exam. Many times you have one at the end called a final exam. And there might be smaller tests. and These are usually called quizzes. So different types of tests are part of the requirements for passing a course. In many courses, you may be asked to write a paper, a term paper, a research paper. So let me tell you a little about that. A term paper is really a large written report, and to do it, you have various steps. The first step is to choose a topic. Your professor might help you to choose a topic. Then you would do research on this topic, on the internet, on a library, or even talking to people. This is doing research, reading and taking notes on that topic. And then the final step is to use your notes to write the paper in your own words. Now, I said those very slightly, in your own words. Now, this is very important. You must use your own language and not take things from other places. Huh? Now, this research paper might be five pages, ten pages, even twenty-five pages long, but it is very important that it be your own work. Now, this is the point where I wish to introduce another term, and this is a big word, plagiarism. P-L-A-G-I-A-R-I-S-M. Plagiarism. Plagiarism is a type of cheating. It means that you put things in your term paper that are not your own work. And this is a very big problem. Uh, it's a warning to all of you that if you do this in North America and get caught, the punishment will be serious. You will certainly flunk the course. You might even be kicked out of the college or of the university. So plagiarism is something to keep in mind. Now, that was a short uh, passage about types of university courses, course requirements, and plagiarism. So I'm going to stop here now and end the, this passage. So for all of you, that is passage for the first unit. Now we go to our exercises based on that passage.
We are going to go to the second part of Unit 1. I think I have something. The answer. Yes, here we are. Sorry about that confusion. Confusion can happen anywhere. So this is what we just heard about, lectures in undergraduate courses in North America. Please do listen to this passage again. Uh, this is an orientation meeting uh, with the academic advisor uh, in the English language program. And you remember that you heard about the different types of courses. Now at the bottom of the page, some very important notes for you. Culture note. Degrees. When you study, at the end of the study you get a degree. Now in English, these are designated in particular ways in North America, also in England. The first is the bachelor's, but we don't use that word. We say B.A., you see there, B point, A point, huh? or B.S. if it's in science. This is after four years of study. Then there's the M.A. or M.S., Master of Arts, Master of Science. That's after maybe two or more additional years. And then finally the Ph.D., the Doctor of Philosophy, and that could again be another two, three, four years. So please notice these are degrees. Huh? Now, if you're doing a BA, you are an undergraduate. If you're doing an MA or PhD, you're considered to be a graduate student or a grad student. Some vocabulary for you to know. Now, we have here some uh, an item, a pre-listening quiz, which you could have done. Some of you may have done it. Let's see what you decided. Some undergraduate lecture classes may have 300 students in them. Yes, we heard about that in the passage, so that is true. Number two, courses at American and Canadian universities are taught only by professors. No, that's false. Remember we heard that sometimes they're taught by graduate assistants or by grad students. Uh, number three, the information in lectures is the same as the information in textbooks, so attending lectures is usually not necessary. No, we heard that's not true, because the lecture might give additional or different information. So it is important to attend lectures in North America. Number four, your homework will always be read and corrected by your professor. No, we heard that many professors have many, too many students, but they have assistants that will do that work for them. So that's false. Number five, a discussion section is a class where students meet informally to help each other with their coursework. I've marked that false because it is formal. It is a class. It counts. It is a requirement. So it's not informal. If it's informal, we just say a discussion group but not a discussion section. Section is part of the course. Six, the ability to write well is not very important for undergraduates. Uh, no, that's definitely false because we heard writing is very important. You have to take notes, and take, taking notes is part of that. Number seven, only graduate students are required to do research. No, we heard that undergraduates in North America also have to do term papers Maybe not advanced research, but nonetheless research. And finally, number eight, if you cheat and you are caught, you might have to leave the university. As we heard, that if you cheat, such as plagiarism, you may be kicked out of the college or the university. Now, on this page, you also see some important vocabulary that was in the passage. Cheating, discussion section, experiment, laboratory or lab lecture, midterm exam, plagiarism, quiz, requirement, teaching assistant, term paper. I hope you understood all of those from the context. The verbs we had were to attend, meaning to be present, to fail a course, which is the opposite of passing it, to get kicked out, and to take notes. Huh? So those were important vocabulary in our passage. Now, note-taking pretest. Which two topics will the speaker talk about? Well, if you listen back, you'll hear that he's talked to types of courses and course requirements. This was made clear at the beginning of the passage 
And often you find at the beginning, the, the speaker, the professor, tells you what the different points are. So it's very important at the beginning to have an idea of the structure of the passage. Number two, which of the following is not a type of university course? Only C, advising. The others, we had lecture course, lab course, and discussion section. Those are all courses. Let's continue with our work here. Number three, which two statements are true? Well, I marked American students use their lecture notes to study for exams. Yes, that we heard is true. And C, discussion sections uh, can have three. Oh, that's not true. That, I, I'm sorry, that's a mistake there. My heavens, I've made a mistake. How can that be? No, that is not right. Um, this is the one that should have been B. In undergraduate courses, the professors meet privately with every student. We heard no. They many times have very large groups. So please notice the true statements were A and B. That C was a slip of the hand. That can happen. All right. Now at the bottom, we see taking notes. Now this is something you will need to do. I can only give you examples. It will be very good if you listen to the passage and try to take notes and then compare with what we look at here in class. Now when the lecture began, he told you that he was going to talk about the university system in North America. He immediately said, I'm going to talk about two things, three types of university courses and course requirements. Now it's very good if you can get those down because that's the basis of your structure in taking notes. Now on the next page, they talk about strategies to taking good notes. Indentation. Well, if you don't know what indentation is, I can show you very nicely here. Notice at the bottom here, we have indentation. Notice that these notes don't go down the side of the page. When something is less important, it's indented. Here, indented, indented. So you go into the page in order to show that this comes under the subject. So indentation means move your text to the right. Indent to show the relationship between main ideas and specific details. The details always go in. Write main ideas next to the left margin. Indent about one half inch, that's one and a half centimeters, as information becomes more specific. Most of the time, your notes will have three or four levels of indentation. You see their main idea, detail, more specifically going in. Now, basic point in note taking, keywords. When you take notes, do not write every word. That would be dictation. Taking notes is not like writing a dictation. Write only the most important or key words. Key words are usually nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. Uh, a third point, a very important one, which we will practice, we use abbreviations and symbols. You can save time if you, you, if you abbreviate. That means to shorten words and use symbols as much as possible. Symbols are not words. They are signs that have a meaning. For example, you might write the arrow. You see the upward arrow to indicate increase or go up. We have a list of common abbreviations and symbols in the appendix of your book. And we'll be practicing these as we go along. So let's have a look now at a sample of good note taking. Identifying the three keys to taking effective lecture notes. Following are sample notes for the first part of the lecture. Look at the notes as you listen again. Notice how the writer used indentation of words, keywords, abbreviations, and symbols huh, to indicate. Now notice we heard about the topic university system in the US. You can go back and listen to the passage and look at this. And you see how nicely, number one, lecture courses. Under it, we have A, B, C, because we heard there are three kinds. Under the first kind, we have some additional information. Important to take notes. Information in LEC, LEC lecture. Huh? Notice we have equal with a line through means is not equal to. That's a nice symbol, a good way to save time. Exam 
k cues, or that's questions based on lex. Now remember that the notes are for you. You must be able to understand that lec means lecture. Don't put L if you don't know what it means. Huh? Shortening is good if you keep the meaning, but the meaning is your decision. Notice uh, in B, STS, that means students. Maybe you want to write STDTS for students. No problem, but you need to get the information down. Notice abbreviation, hours, week. So different abbreviations and symbols are helped in note-taking. Let's look at some more of this here at the remainder of the lecture here. Okay, discussion section, smaller, 20 to 30 students. Ask questions, go over HW. Well, HW should mean homework. How do we know that? You have to know that. You write it down. If it's too uh, unclear for you, then maybe you need to read H-O-W-K, homework. But standard H-W, taught by T-A, teaching assistant, you maybe remember from the first book, not prof, professor. Huh? So notice the use of abbreviations and symbols. Do you need to do this? Yes, because you will hear passages, you take down information, and use it to answer questions. Now here they give you an example of something that is not indented and they show you how this really is not very good so I thought it a good idea to do it correctly huh? now when we change that you can look back if you like you see now I have made it in order course requirements below it tests exams under test exams midterm final quizzes and so this then makes it very clear and you can have a look at this uh, later on your own huh? This will be in your content. All of this will be for you to review later. All right, now we'd like to review the vocabulary that we've had in this, uh, in this passage, university courses, professors, course requirement. All of these are important vocabulary for us. Now we move on to our contexts. We always have contexts to do. And here are our contexts on page 17 the context for this unit. Now, we, in the last unit, I'm sorry, the last course, we also had our context. And remember, context is what occurs around information. From the context, you should be able to answer questions. When you listen to people talking in English, it is probably hard to understand all the words. However, you can usually get a general idea of what they are saying. How? By using clues that help you to guess. These clues include words, synonyms, meaning words that have the same meaning, paraphrase. Many times a person speaking explains the word. Transitions, stressed words, intonation, a speaker's tone of voice, your knowledge of the culture. All of these you use and we'll see how we do that when we do the context. Now, many tests, as they tell you, such as the TOEFL, measure your academic listening and speaking abilities. This activity and others in the book will develop your social and academic conversation skills. This will give you a foundation for success on a variety of standardized texts. Now we're going to listen to some contexts. Context based on the same subject we had in this unit. And you remember this unit subject is academic life. So now it's time for us to do our context for the first unit. So please look at number one. I have given the correct answer, but you listen and see if you agree. This is the conversation, number one. What's wrong? Well, I've got a term paper due in a week, and all the books I need are checked out. I know what you mean. There are millions of books in this place, but I can never find what I need. Question. Where are the speakers? In a bookstore, in a library, in a laboratory, in an English class. 
Well, clearly, there are people who want to get books. Now, they didn't talk about buying books. Notice they said checked out. Huh? You check out a book in a library, not in a bookstore. So the best choice was a library. Also, we heard uh, doing a term paper and millions of books, so probably it would be a library. Let's go to the next one, number two. A. Can I come see you tomorrow? B. Sure. What's the problem? A. I am totally confused about this week's chemistry experiment. B. Didn't you come to the lab yesterday? A. Yeah, but I had to leave early and I missed part of your demonstration. Who is this person probably talking to? Chem uh, a chemist, a secretary, a roommate, or a TA? Now, certainly it is a laboratory, but I think it's teaching. Why? Because this week's experiment, I had to leave, and so this sounds like a classroom, and so the correct choice is a TA, a teaching assistant. So our clues here, we're hearing about the lab, she had to leave early, and the week's chemistry experiment. So if you have a chemistry experiment every week, I don't think this is a, a chemist uh, professional chemist. It sounds like a class. Huh? Conversation three. A. What are the requirements for this course? B. Uh, there will be a grammar quiz every Monday and there will be a final exam. Also, you're required to go to the language lab two hours each week. And of course, you have to attend class and participation is very important. What type of class is being asked about? Now, the correct choice is German, because we heard about grammar and we heard about language lab. Now, that would not be true for chemistry or history or business. So German is clearly the correct choice. Conversation four. A. You asked to see me, Professor Jansen? B. Yes, Sherman. Would you like to explain what happened on this research paper? A. What do you mean, sir? B. It's almost exactly the same as a paper I received from another student two years ago. What is probably true that the student did? Failed an exam, was late to class, plagiarized a term paper, or forgot to do a homework assignment? The correct choice is C, because the professor said almost the same as. Huh? So that means there was cheating. This is the same as a paper he had got earlier. Now, in this unit, we move on to intonation. In fact, this is one of the uh, points of discussion for this uh, unit uh, about intonation. Intonation is the rising and falling of your voice. I can say, uh, it is a book, or I can say, it is a book. That makes that change of intonation makes it a question. Or if I'm angry, it is a book. That is a different intonation. Huh? So intonation is part of meaning. So meaning comes not only from words, but also from the way English speakers use their voices. For example, listen to the sentence. I got 75% on the test, spoken in three different ways. Circle the speaker's feeling in each case. I got 75% on the test. That's sad, huh? I got 75% on the test. That's happy. I got 75% on the test. That's angry. I got 75% on the test. Disappointed. Same words, different intonation, different meaning. Intonation is part of language. In fact, that's going to be your discussion point on the forum for this lecture. I will introduce that at the end of the lecture, though. All right, let's listen for intonation clues. Huh? This would be something now you have to listen here uh, to decide, uh, in this case, whether the person is excited, uninterested, or angry. Okay, are you ready to do that? 
Conversation 1A. Hello? Jeff? Ah, this is Ron, you know, from your history class? Oh, hi. Listen, I was wondering, uh, were you planning to go to Ali's house on Sunday to watch football? Hmm, I haven't really thought about it yet. Where would you like to go? You mean with you? Yeah. How does Jeff feel about the invitation? Excited, uninterested, or angry? We're going to say excited because he said, well would, you, you, well, would you like to go? You mean with you? You know, this sounds excited. Now we'll take the same conversation, different intonation, and let's see how that is. Hello. Uh, Jeff, this is Ron. You know from your history class? Oh, hi. Uh, listen, I was wondering, uh, were you planning to go to Ali's house on Sunday to watch football? Hmm, I haven't really thought about it yet. Well, would you like to go? Uh, you mean with you? Yeah. So here we have uninterested, huh? We chose uninterested. Let's listen to two more conversations with different intonations. Conversation 2A. Did you hear the news? Professor Bradley had to go out of town suddenly. All his classes are canceled this week. Canceled? I'm really wondering about my score on the last test. Canceled? I'm really... So she's worried about it. But now listen to the same conversation, but with a different attitude. Did you hear the news? Professor Bradley had to go out of town suddenly. All his classes are canceled this week. Canceled? Oh, I have an extra week. Oh, yeah. So that's happy intonation. Intonation is part of language. You should be able to identify proper intonation. Um, some language that we have to look at here on page 19 about accepting and refusing invitations. Huh? Notice in this conversation we have the invitation. I was wondering if you would. Huh? Would you like to go? These are invitations asking people to do it. And so we're going to look at different ways of doing that. Notice here on the next page, making, accepting, and refusing invitation. Would you like to go hiking? I'd love to go. Or refusing, thanks, but I'm busy. Okay, so refusing, so do review that in your unit. Now our last thing in every unit is a task. Our task in this unit is reading a map. When reading a map, you have to know that north is to the top, south to the bottom, east to the right, and west to the left. So you'll need that sometimes in reading a map. We also need certain phrases. These are phrases that you need to know about a map. Check these later. Notice at the intersection, number two, you see down there, at the intersection of the two streets, we have beside the bank, number four. See it down there, beside the bank. We have across the street from, on both sides of the street. So please review these and make sure you understand them. Huh? This is about reading a map. Because the way we test you on this is to give you a map like this, and maybe you'd be asked some questions. And that's what I'm going to ask you right now. You see these questions up there, true, false, and true? Well, I did them for you. You'll have them. But now let's do them together, and then you can check them later and see why they're true or false. Number one, the math building is down the street from the Memorial Cafeteria. Now here we have Memorial Cafeteria, here we have the math building, here Memorial Cafeteria is down. Down the street is this way, it's up the street, so that is false, huh? Up the street, down the street, huh? you see that in your illustration. The next one, the computer science building is across the street from the theater. If you look there, computer science, yes, theater on the other side, that is true. Number three, the business hall is at the intersection of Campus Road and Jones Street. Well, yes, there they are, the two streets, that is the intersection, so we're going to say that is true. Number four, Memorial Cafeteria is in the middle of the block on Bridge Road. Oh, no, that is not true, because you see it's on the corner. It's not in the middle. This would be the middle of the block. huh? The Shakespeare Hall, for example, is in the middle of the block. So that we're going to say that is false. Five, there is a park 
beside the math building. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. We see it there. It is beside, huh? Beside it, okay? Number six, the boathouse is between Lakeshore Drive and College Lake. Yes, that's true. Here we have the lake. Here we have the drive. The boathouse is between the two. Very good. The, number seven, there are buildings on both sides of Bradford Avenue. This is Bradford Avenue. Yes, we have some on the right. We have some on the left. And finally, Smith Library is opposite the Science Hall. Oh, that's false. It's not opposite. The math building here is opposite. That is beside. Huh? Okay. So these are terms about places, and that's part of our task. Now, I hope with the materials I've given you, you'll be able to review and learn a lot about these things. Uh, and so now the last thing I want to do is to give you the points of emphasis for the first, uh, the first chapter. There were two lectures. Now, this is the question I will for the first one about reductions. Are reductions part of all languages? For example, Arabic, huh? So that's something you should need to discuss and talk about. Make sure you understand reductions. That's our first question. The second question is about intonation. What role does intonation play in language? For example, your language, which is Arabic. Huh? What is the general role? So those are questions for unit chapter one. That's lectures one and two. So now we have finished the first chapter. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot and uh, wish you all the best. See you in chapter two.